you are a part of the Warsaw Baptist Church family, I just want to welcome you back. If you are a visitor or a guest, uh, we just want to thank you for being here. This is uh, a goal of ours to have a church that everybody feels welcome at. Um, and and if, you, uh, if you have any questions about what you hear here, what you see here, uh, please uh, make sure to ask me at the end of the service. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions. If you didn't see it on our announcements, we will have a meeting right after the service for VBS. So if you are a volunteer or a leader or if you have supplies for VBS, if you have questions about VBS, it's coming up starting Wednesday, right? So uh, we, we want to just have a quick meeting to hammer out all those details. Um, if you could be in prayer with us, um, we have uh, several people in our, in our church family that are, are struggling. Um, Christy uh, Holleran is uh, recovering from her cancer surgery. She's about to start her other treatments. Um, but she had a, a post-operative complication. I forgot what it's called, but uh, it's not comfortable. So, so please be in prayer for her. Be in prayer for her husband, Jimmy, uh, who has put off his surgery consult until she heals up. Um, but he's got some major back issues that need to be taken care of. Uh, please be in prayer for Terry and his family. Uh, his mom passed away this week. Uh, please be in prayer for Shannon and the rest of her family as her aunt... Uh, Kay Brashear uh, passed away this week. Uh, pray for those who are struggling with financial stress, relational issues, uh, those who are overcoming addiction or are still in the, the madness of their addiction. Uh, pray for the churches across the globe that are uh, meeting to do the same thing we're doing right now. Uh, pray specifically for our church plant that, we've, uh, that we support in Indianapolis, Refuge Bible Church. And uh, pray for uh, the Methodist Church. They have a new pastor now, Wes Shoemaker. Uh, so pray for him and, and them. Um, and, uh, and, and just continue to pray for Gallant Community Church, which meets here uh, in, the, in the earlier part of the day. Um, they are uh, getting more and more uh, stuff organized, and they should be breaking ground on their new building soon. So as soon as we know the date for that, we'll, uh, we'll announce it. Um, any other prayers or praises? Yes. Yes, yes. Keep, keep Kay's whole family in your prayers. Um, Shannon is, is her niece, so, yeah. So this is my, my grandniece. Your grandniece? Yes, her name is Emma. Emma? Okay. Okay, okay. Pray for, for Emma, and that's Mikey's grandniece. So, um, any other prayers or praises? Any prayers or praises? Kelsey, anything? Okay. <laughs> Um, we want to we want to thank Kelsey uh, from GCC. She's helping out today as we've got Ashley and Austin helping out. I think at Concord, um, it's it's a beautiful thing. We just help each other out whenever there's a need, and uh, so so pray for them. I, again, I think they're at Concord today. It's hard to keep track. <laughs> and uh, and thank you, Kelsey, for for helping us. Uh, thank you also for for, <laughs> for always helping us. The Millers are a great blessing. Um, and then most of all, we want to pray for the lost. Um, we all have loved ones who are still out there, um, who have still said no to Jesus. Um, so we want to pray for them and pray for gospel opportunities with them. Amen. Father God, we love you and we thank you for this time that we get to come and, and worship you in, in song and praise, in the preaching and hearing of your word. And Lord, I pray specifically for those mentioned this morning, uh, but also, Lord, there are, there are many prayer requests that, uh, for one reason or another, uh, some of our people might be uh, hesitant to share. But Lord, you know what's going on in the lives of, of, of everyone here, everyone watching. And so, Lord, I pray that you would um, uh, work in their lives, be tangibly felt in their lives. And Lord, help us to be a church, help us to be a people. That, that just displays the wonder and the beauty of the kingdom that is coming. And Lord, help us to be a people who are always ready to give a reason for the hope that we have, and that reason being you, Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said?
Amen. All right. So uh, we're going to get into a time of worship. If you are new to Warsaw Baptist Church, we worship in three primary ways. We worship in our singing, we worship in our giving, and we worship in the preaching and hearing of God's Word. If you're new or a visitor, uh, please forget about the the giving part. We just want to be a blessing to you. Uh, We don't want anything from you. We just want to be here for you. Um, If you are a part of the Warsaw Baptist Church family, the, the way we keep the lights on and keep everything going is we do... Uh, give to the ministry here. We have giving boxes at the doors to the sanctuary, and uh, most of you already know we have giving options online. If you just go to warsawbaptist.com, you can give directly there. So we're going to get into a time of singing, and as we sing, if you don't know what we're doing, these, these people here are not here to perform for you, all right? They're here to worship God and bring you into that time of worship, amen? All right, so let's, let's sing. Walking down 
soul, I need you.
Amen. Amen. Whew. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Before we release the kids, can we just say amen to that song? Goodness. Um, there are so many stories in this church alone where we can, we can look at our past life. We're looking, you know, in the song at the actual resurrection, but so many of us have been raised up from unbelievable depths and raised up to new life in Christ. And uh, that is, is such a powerful song, and I'm so grateful that I got to sing it with you. Um, we're going to release the kids to nursery. If you're new to Warsaw Baptist Church, we have nursery every week for kids up to kindergarten age, and then children's church on the second and fourth Sundays of the month. So uh, let's pray for the nursery workers and the kids. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your love. We ask that you would uh, be with the children as they go to nursery. I pray that you would be with the nursery workers. Lord, please help them to uh, serve with a heart like yours. Help them to uh, pray over these children and love these children uh, in, in a way that, that, that sets them up to be released back to their families, ready to be discipled. Lord, help us to, to know as caregivers and parents that no matter what our age of our children's, uh, if, if they are in the home, we are disciple makers of them. They are learning something from us, and we want them to learn the right things. We want, to learn, we want them to learn the gospel. We want them to learn how the gospel applies to their whole life. Lord, so, so help these children and help us who, who care for these children. And Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' perfect and precious name. All God's people said, amen. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started in Haggai as they go back to the nursery. So if you have a Bible with you, um, go to Haggai. If you don't own a Bible or if you don't have a Bible with you, there should be a hardback blue one near you in the pew. Haggai is two chapters and he's one of the minor prophets, so he might be hard to find. Um, in the Pew Bible, he's on page 791. If you have your own Bible and you just go to the beginning of the New Testament in the book of Matthew, just go back, I don't know, a dozen pages and you'll be right near Haggai. So we're only uh, three prophets away from being done with this series in the minor prophets. Uh, we've got Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And, uh, and then we are going to get back into the Psalms. Um, but Haggai is, is incredible. And um, part, of, part of the reason I think Haggai is incredible is because I'm a theology nerd. And, and there's so much to unpack about this idea of the temple. Um, but I've got a reminder uh, in my Bible most Sundays to, to just answer the question, so what? Um, because some of you might be here and you might say, I've got real problems in my life. What in the world am I going to gain from learning about the temple? What is this besides just some egghead theology? And, and, and I'm telling you, it answers so many questions. So, so stick with us until we're done, and hopefully you will see it. Um, if you could stand for the reading of God's word, we're going to be in uh, Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 to start. And once you're there, you can go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's word. The reason we do this here at Warsaw Baptist Church is to show reverence for the God who gave us the word, uh, but also just to push away the distractions that we uh, maybe came in here with. And, uh, and I, I pray that that will happen for you now. So Haggai, again, Pew Bible, page 791, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shittiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, verse 3, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet, now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. 
For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And then look at verse 9. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church body. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your family. Lord, that happened by the work of your son. Jesus, you came down, you died, you took the punishment we deserved after living a perfect life that we couldn't live. And because we have put our faith in that, we are now saints. We are now part of the church. But Lord, sometimes when we are walking through this broken world, our sainthood doesn't feel like it's real. Sometimes the things that you say about who we are uh, seem to conflict with who we know ourselves to be as we still struggle with sin and we still struggle with the brokenness around us. But Lord, I want to, 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 to just see and, and have our people see the glory of your presence with us in this place this morning. And I want them to see that it is just a taste of the glory that will be revealed. Lord, I can't do that by the power of my words. This group of people here in this room, this group of people watching from home, they don't need a gifted speaker. They need the Holy Spirit to bridge the gap right now between my words and their hearts. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I believe, Holy Spirit, that you want to bless us. If there are any of us here in this room or watching who have grieved you, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would forgive even right now and fill us up with the truth of your word. It's in Jesus' perfect and precious name that all God's people said, amen. You can have a seat. Let's dig in. Today may be a little more teachy than preachy. Um, because we need to understand, we need to rightly understand the temple or what we read about here as the house that God kept talking about to the people here. We need to understand what the temple is if we are going to rightly understand Haggai. Now, who has read Haggai before? Don't lie. Okay, three of you. Okay, it's, it's, it's a book that's buried in your Bible. It's two pages. You might not have ever seen it before. It's a name that I had to look up how to pronounce this week. Dominic said, well, you know, you, you know Hebrew scholars. Just watch one of them and see how they do it. What good is this book? What good is it to know what Haggai has to say to the Jewish people thousands of years ago? Um, if you are on our Facebook page, you might have seen I shared a video uh, from a, a professor named G.K. Beal. And if you want to dig deeper than what I go this morning, you can do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take a, uh, an aerial view of the Bible and say, okay, from Genesis to Revelation, there is this idea that ties all of it together. And we want to know what all of it says so that we can understand the book of Haggai. Does that make sense? So, so if you're new to the Bible, this is 66 different books. But we believe, and I know from studying it over and over, every book is connected to the other. There is no, there is no part of this book that you should try to understand without knowing the rest of the book. Um, sometimes pastors and Christians get in trouble when they go to one verse and they say, oh, this verse, I love this verse. And they make it say what they want it to say. But if they would just read the verses around it, read the chapter around it, they might have come to a different conclusion. They take the, the text out of the context, right? We need to do the same thing with all of the Bible. It's good for you to have a favorite book. Mine is Philippi. 
The Philippians is, is my favorite book in the Bible. But if I don't know what the rest of the Bible says, I'm not going to get what he's referencing in all those different places. Haggai is an incredible book, but we need to take this overview, this arch from Genesis to Revelation so that you can truly understand it. The temple was the place where God dwelled with his people. And the first place we see God dwell with his people was not in a building, it was in a garden. If you were to, and and I'm going to mention a lot of text today. We're not going to put them up on the screen. If you're a note taker, you know, start jotting down. Um, In Genesis 3, we see that God walked in the cool of the day in the garden with humanity. See, that's exactly how we were designed to live. We were designed to live in relationship and in fellowship with God. And yet, if you read Genesis 3, you'll see that we screwed all of that up. Three chapters into the Bible. Three chapters into the Bible, we took everything that he gave us that was good and wrecked it. And so then he was not willing to allow his holiness to interact with our sinfulness, and he cast us out of the garden. And I say us very deliberately. You might say, well, I wasn't there. I wouldn't have done that. Yes, you would have. We're all tied to Adam and Eve. We are all born into sin. But, but all of us can point back to different points in our life and say, you know what? I had everything in this situation or that situation. And there was just this one thing that I shouldn't do. And I did it and wrecked it. If that's not you, you just haven't lived long enough, right? Everyone else in this room can say, yep, I did it. We sinned against God and we were cast out of the garden. We were cast out of this dwelling place between God and man. And then later, if you zip through to the book of Exodus, God takes this man Moses and he gives him a template for this new place where God will dwell in relationship and fellowship with mankind. And that was called the tabernacle. If you, if you want to take notes, it's in Exodus 25 through 40. It's a very detailed template for how this place should be built. It's a a dwelling place where, once again, God will be able to walk with his people. And and it's going to be different than the garden in that it's going to be a very guarded, very protected dwelling place. So in the garden, there's no indication that there was anything limiting contact between God and humanity. But in the tabernacle, God zeroes in and says, okay, I will dwell with my people in this place, but my holiest area of the tabernacle is a place where only one person can come once a year, and they can come in, but if they haven't cleansed themselves, they will be, they'll drop dead. And so he established a way that he could interact with his people, but it was guarded, and it was to one, in one place interacting with one face, and it was only to one race. It was only to the Hebrews, to the Jews. It wasn't a, 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 an interaction with all of humanity. It was, it was just with this one race, one place, one face. But at least it was a place where we could, again, start to reform a relationship with the God that we ran away from. And and so then, if you know the story, the people of Israel, they wandered in the desert for 40 years, and then they went into Jerusalem, they went into Israel, they went into their land, their promised land, and when their second king, King David, uh, was reigning, he said, I want to build a permanent structure for the Lord. And because of of the blood on his hands from the wars that he had fought, God said, I'm not going to have you build that but I will honor that desire that you have. And I'm going to always make sure that there's one of your people on the throne. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to resource your son Solomon with all of the wisdom and all of the workers and all of the wealth needed to build this permanent-ish building where I will dwell. And if you look at the, the blueprints that, that we have in the Bible for the temple, uh, the temple is just a permanent tabernacle 
It's got almost the same layout. It is, it is, this, it is this place that we see in uh, 2 Chronicles 36 where God allowed uh, his people to, to, to dwell with him. And, and, and one interesting thing that you see if you follow this track all the way through is the same word in the Hebrew for him walking in the cool of the garden in Genesis 3 is the same word that it uses for him dwelling with the people and, and, and being in the tabernacle and the same word that is used for him being in the temple. But then we sinned again. He built this temple. He says, as long as you will follow me, as long as you will, as, as long as you will just do what I tell you to do. And, and, and none of the things that he told him to do was to be a burden. It was to say, you are designed to live like this. He told them how to live, how to treat one another, how to worship him. And they, they failed on every check mark. They failed on everything. And so... He sent prophet after prophet after prophet. If you've been here through the series on the prophets, the major prophets and minor prophets, so far up to Haggai, it's been pretty brutal because those prophets were, were prophets that were mainly talking to the people before he finally said, enough's enough. And he allowed his people to be taken into exile. But when he allowed his people to be taken into exile, in 2 Chronicles 36, God also allowed his temple to be destroyed. This temple, this, this mighty, gorgeous, extravagant temple that Solomon built was taken down to the ground. The city was taken down. The walls around the temple were destroyed and the people were taken into captivity. And this is exactly what God said would happen if they did not interact with him in the way that he had designed us to interact. Has anybody here ever had to deal with consequences? And as much as they hurt, once you had a little bit of, of clarity, you're saying, I knew this was what would happen. I, I knew that if I did X, this was the next thing that was going to happen. I was told. I was warned by my mom and dad. I was warned by a cop. I was warned by whoever. If I do this, this happens. That's what happened here. God said over and over, if you will repent, if you will turn back to me, I will relent of this disaster that I'm bringing. And they, over and over, to a man said, I don't believe you. Some of the prophets that he sent, God said, listen, I'm going to send you to tell them this, and they're not going to listen to you. They're going to have other prophets that talk to them and say, everything's fine, peace, peace, even though God said there is no peace. And so he brought this disaster and then he brought, while they're in exile, they're, they're enslaved, they're in exile, they're far from their people, far from their land. In the exile, he sends another prophet named Ezekiel. And, and in Ezekiel, we get this promise that God is going to restore his people and bring the remnant of his people back to the land. But not only that, he also promises this incredible description of a restored temple building. If you want to read about that, later go to Ezekiel chapter 40 through 47 and again some people say that is the most boring part of the Bible because it's laying out like this kind of jewel and that kind of gold and this many cubits and all this stuff but if you're one of the Israelites in exile who thinks everything has been destroyed and you're told no it's going to be rebuilt and it's going to be better than anything you've ever seen those are not boring chapters those are things that you keep saying, Dad, tell me about it again. Tell me again what Ezekiel said. And not only did he promise that there would be this great temple that was going to outshine all the, 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 the splendor of Solomon's temple, but he also said that this temple would have living water which flowed from the temple and, and, and nourished the entire earth. But... When we get to Haggai, when, and if you wonder where Haggai is, he's, his book is right around the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah, right after the exiles come back. And the exiles come back, and the Israelites uh, do, in fact, return and rebuild. You can read all about that in Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and the next book, Zechariah. 
But the old heads, the, 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 the people who had been there when they were exiled and had seen the temple before it was destroyed now looked at this temple that was being built and they wept. They looked at this temple that was being built and they said, is this it? Ezekiel promised us a temple that was going to be bigger and better than anything we'd ever seen and, and this is what we have? If you, if you skip back to Ezra chapter 3, I'll read this brief section. This talks about when the foundations of the temple were, were rebuilt. When the foundations were laid and they, they got an idea of, okay, it's going to be this big. In, in Ezra 3, 10, it says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests... And their vestments came forward with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good and his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord. Because the foundation of the Lord was laid So you've got a huge contingent of people saying, praise God, it's starting. We're returned to Israel. The temple is being rebuilt. Praise the Lord. But, verse 12 says, many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, the first temple, they wept with a loud voice when they saw this foundation, this, the foundation of this house being laid Though many shouted aloud with joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout and the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout and the sound was heard far away. That's the context of what we read at the very beginning. You've got all of these people celebrating except for the old heads who said, this is nothing. This is nothing. When I was uh, first here as a pastor, when I first came here in 2014, I had a, a sweet saint sister who is now with the Lord who, who said, oh, Ken, if you could have seen this building when it was full, if you could have seen this building when, when I forget what it was called, it was the hanging of the greens or something, this place was packed out. Balconies full, pews full, I think that was the same sort of feeling that these people had. They, they said, I mean, it's great that it's here, but it's not what it was. So God says to them in verse 3 of, of Haggai 2, who's left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? He says, is, is it... Is it nothing in your eyes? And then he promises something incredible. He promises something that seems to say, okay, this is your reality right now, but don't lose sight. I am going to keep my promise. This is your reality. This is what you have to look at right now. But look at this the way I look at this. Look at this not in the immediate context, but my promises which will endure, which will come true. And so he ties this piddly foundation with the promise that Ezekiel had given while they were in exile. He says, yet now, now be strong. O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak. The high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. So his first thing to tell them is, right now, be strong. Right now, be strong. Some of you are listening to the sound of my voice, and you are going through something that is bringing tears of weeping to your eyes. Everybody else might seem to be going on like normal, and you're wondering, how can you possibly be going on like normal when I am dealing with this? Anybody been through that? Like you're going through a trial and you're, you're wondering how people are just getting up and going to work the next day? I remember when my brother died, for years, I was just like, how can you people 
just go about your day. My brother's dead. It, it, it didn't make sense to me. Like, I was devastated. I couldn't hardly get out of bed, and these people were just going about their day. In that moment, in the moment that you're in right now, if you are in a moment of, of, of stress and anxiety or grief, God would say to you right now, be strong. And he says then, at the end of verse 4, work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. For I am with you. One of the things that we're going to see as we track this temple idea throughout the Bible is that the work, the life of the Christian faith, the, the treasure at the end of our journey... All of it is the same thing. The, the motivation and catalyst for me to get up in the morning is the same as what the treasure is going to be on that last day. It's that the Lord is with me. It's that the Lord is with you. Now, now I'm just going to ask this, and I don't want you to answer out loud. Just think about the answer. Is that enough for you? Christian, if you're, if you're not a Christian yet, then hold on. If you're a Christian, is it enough for you that the Lord is with you? That the Lord will be with you? The punishment that Adam and Eve suffered was the Lord would not be with them. The promise of the, the reason the, the people of Israel put all of this money and power and, 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 and skill into building the tabernacle was because there was a promise that the Lord would be with them there. Same thing with the temple. They, they poured in all these resources because they knew the Lord would be there. Is that enough for you with what you're going through right now. If no one else is with you, is it okay so long as the Lord is with you? If all the money dries up, is it okay so long as the Lord is still with you? If your health takes a dive, is it okay as long as the Lord is with you? If the person you love the most were to walk away, would that be okay so long as the Lord is still with you? He is the treasure. He is the fuel for us. He is everything. He says, I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Forget about the piddly foundation. I am with you. And listen, according to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. So he says, be strong, work, and don't be afraid because I am with you. In a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house, the temple, shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So, so God, God says, all those things that Ezekiel promised you are yet to come, but they're coming. All of the promises that the, the Bible has for you, if you are a believer, even if they have yet to come, you can count on the fact they're coming. The peace that you might not have in your heart or in your life or in your relationships right now, stick with the Lord, they are coming. The joy that, that maybe is getting sapped out of you by all of the griefs of this world, stand by. His promises are true, and they will be realized. Amen? They will be realized. This is the promise of God, and this was the promise that he gave through Haggai to these people as they looked at this piddly foundation of this building. Now, here's the weird thing. Talking about the temple again. 
what he promised through Ezekiel and what he promised here through Haggai has not yet physically been realized. Physically, there has not been anything to compare to the picture of the temple that God gave Ezekiel. There was another temple built, and then around, uh, I think, 50 or 60 years before Jesus came, this King Herod renovated it, and then they called it Herod's Temple. And some people thought, okay, that is the fulfillment physically. Some saw that Herod's renovations uh, made this place into what was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And they said, ah, now it is spectacular. Now it is ornate. Now it is full of glory. But here's the problem with that. Herod was not a Jewish person. He was a puppet king, and he was an evil man. Now, here's my question. If you have a beautiful building and it is supported by evil, is that a temple of God that you think could fulfill this? No. The temple of God, as ornate as they could make it, was nothing without the Spirit of God in it. One of the interesting things as you look at the the temple as it goes through the Bible is when the tabernacle was built and it was finished and they they put all the pieces in place, it says then the, 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 the Lord came down and dwelt among them and it was tangible. You could see this cloud. You could see the fire at night. God was there. When the temple was built... And Solomon had finished dedicating it. It said that the the fire and the smoke came down and you could see that God was there. That doesn't happen when the people rebuild after the exile. Do you know what was missing in the Holy of Holies of the temple when they rebuilt? The Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was already lost. There's all kinds of books you can read. People have theories about where the ark went. I have no idea. It doesn't say. But it wasn't there in this next temple. Now, God said, I am still here, but tangibly you couldn't see it. You had to totally accept by faith that he was there. If it was just based on what you could see or feel, you might not get it. And when Herod rebuilt this temple... You never saw God tangibly there until this one guy walked in. Until Jesus went into the temple, God was not in Herod's temple. And what Jesus did when Jesus came is he flipped all of our expectations of what the temple would be on their head. So if you read the, the Gospel of John, in John 1.14, it says the Word, this is Jesus, the Word became flesh, and, and what did he do? He dwelt among us. Do you know what, do you know what the, 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 the word for dwelt is? Literally, it's he tabernacled among us. He tabernacled among us. He, he camped with us. Just as God dwelt with his people in the garden, just as he dwelt with his people in the tabernacle and in the temple, now the word becomes flesh and he dwells among us. And now he's not dwelling in a building. He's dwelling in the mess of our life. In John 2, 19, Jesus says, listen, you need to stop thinking about the temple from here on out as a building. In John chapter 2, verse 19, uh, he says, listen, tear down this temple, and in three days I'll rise it up, raise it up again. And they said, it took 40 some odd years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days? And it's because he was not talking about a physical temple anymore. Some people will argue with you all day that, no, there will be another physical temple. According to Jesus, that temple era is over. Now the temple is something spiritual. Now if you want to see a physical temple, you look at Christ. And you look at, we'll see in just a second, his church. At the end of the Gospel of Mark in chapter 15, verses 37 through 38, it says that as Jesus takes his last breath and dies on the cross... 
the curtain or the veil of the temple is torn from the top to the bottom. And that was a once and for all signifier that where God used to be in this one place, reserved, resigned, far back from the people in the Holy of Holies, he's busted out. He's everywhere that believers are. He is in the church. In fact, this is what, what Jesus promised when he, was, when he was talking to the people in, in John 7. Remember in John 7, he says, come to me, you who are thirsty. Do you remember this? You who are thirsty, come to me, and I will give you springs of living water. And it says in John 7 that he was talking about the Holy Spirit, which they hadn't received yet because he hadn't yet died, been resurrected, gone back to heaven. Remember when he went, before he went back to heaven, he told the, the early Christians, he says, don't go do anything until you have the Holy Spirit. But once you have the Holy Spirit, you will have rivers of living water flowing through you. Now, where did we see a promise of, of, a, of, a, of a flowing stream of living water? In Ezekiel, we saw a picture of this river of living water coming from the temple to, to give the whole earth water. Jesus says, once you are the church, you have that living water, and you are, we are, the church to spread that water across the whole earth. Once Jesus went to heaven, he says, you are the temple. You are the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple? And what's so significant about that? Because you're his temple, the spirit of God dwells in you. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. Walk among them, again, same word for as he walked in the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve. You are that temple. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22 so, so, says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is being joined together and grows into a holy temple into the Lord. Also in him you are being built together. You, the church are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So every time you see this idea of temple, you see God dwelling with his people. And everywhere after the, the crucifixion and resurrection, that is us. It is not this place. It is these people. If you are here and you're not yet a Christian, I just want you to know that as you look at us Christians, as messed up as we are, you're seeing the temple of God as we join together in worship. Because the Holy Spirit is dwelling among us. If, if you go to Acts chapter 2 or 3, 2, and you see on the day of Pentecost, do you remember this story? Maybe If you're not from church, you might not. On the day of Pentecost, this is the day that as the disciples were all gathered in a room, they're still waiting for the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes, and, and tangibly, what is seen above their heads? Do you remember? Tongues of fire. For the first time since the, the Solomon's temple was destroyed, there is a tangible, visible expression of God's presence in his temple which is the people of God isn't that amazing like I'm 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 in, I'm a nerd I understand but that's amazing to me it's like no fire no fire no fire fire he's here he's he's here and then, and then it just gets better see we are the earthly temple now and we are a better picture of what all those temples of the Old Testament, Tabernacle Temple, all that, they were just pointing to something better, which would be the church in the world. No longer limited to a place in the Middle East, we are now everywhere filling the whole world with the living water of God. 
But just as we are a better picture of what was, we are also just a picture of the best that is to come. We are a picture of what's to come that will completely fulfill all the prophecies of Ezekiel, will completely fulfill all that we should be and still aren't. See, there's a temple coming that isn't even a temple. Go, go to Revelation chapter 21. Go ahead and turn there. If you're not used to your Bible, Revelation is the last book in the Bible. Revelation 21 is the second to last chapter in your Bible. Revelation 21, verse 1, and I'll read through 4. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. We talked about that last week with the day of the Lord. It's, a, it's gone. It's burned up. It's gone. But there is a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth and, had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw, listen, a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place, get that term that we've seen all through the Bible, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Where was the temple and the tabernacle? Once, once they got done wandering? It was in Jerusalem. Now there's a new Jerusalem. And it's this beautiful picture. And if you kept reading, I don't have time to unpack it all. But if you keep reading, it talks about this, this new place that has uh, all equal sides... It's a, it's a perfect cube, which is just a picture of this perfect square in Ezra's temple uh, understanding. Uh, there's all these jewels and all this stuff is, is described. But then look at verse 22 of, verse, of chapter 21. Again, if you're new to the Bible, you're looking for the little number 22 after the big number 21. It says, and I saw no temple in the city. So it seems like this city is the temple, but then it says, no, 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 no. There is no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the lamp, is, is, its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And the gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will, bring it into the they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It goes on in chapter two, or 22 to say, Then the angel of the Lord showed me the river of water of life. Remember this idea of the water of life that was going to flow from the temple? The water of life that flows from the church? Now... In this place where the Lord is the temple, says there is a river flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life and the 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. And they will need no light or lamp of, or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. Earlier on in chapter 21, it says all the nations are going to pour in their, their treasury. That's what we see in Haggai. And Haggai, he says, I know this foundation looks piddly, but... A day is coming, and it's coming soon, when all the nations will pour in their treasures into this temple. <laughs> there are so many connections that I haven't even gotten to talk about because we are limited on time, or you are. But please study this for yourself. Again, watch the video if you're on Facebook. Watch the video if you don't have Facebook. Let me know, and I'll, I'll send you a link. There's a really big book that the guy wrote. I don't think you'll read it, but it's, it's, it's really good. So why in the world did I spend all this time talking about the temple? 
Because if you don't understand what the temple symbolized in the Old Testament, what the temple is right now in the church age, and what the temple will be in heaven, if you don't understand that, then you will misapply the book of Haggai. I have heard churches and pastors use the book of Haggai as their, as their go-to text for a building campaign. Maybe you've been in a church where they've done that. And here's what I'm talking about. Go over to uh, Haggai chapter 1, and let me just read verses 2 through 14, and you'll, you'll be able to connect the dots, I think. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say that the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you to yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does not put them into, it puts them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld their dew, and the earth has withheld its produce, and I have called for a drought on the land and the hills on the grain, the new wine, the oil on the ground that brings forth the man and beast and all their labors. When Zerub then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and Joshua, the son of Je Je Jeho Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people feared the Lord. And then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, which we heard earlier, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shittiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord and the, hosts, and the Lord of hosts, their God. Now, can you see how a pastor could tie that to a building campaign? Now, in its context, historically, God said those things for a building campaign. To Haggai, for the people of Israel, after the exile, when everything was just in ruins. But that is not what he's saying to us. Because, again, the temple is not a building. We are the temple. So how in the world should we apply this to us? Remember I said that I have a card here that reminds me to answer the so what question. So what? Who cares about the temple, Ken? I've got problems in my life. Well, first off, I'll tell you, our building needs money, muscles, know-how, time, I, I hope that you, if you're a part of the church, are giving all of those things. If you're not, see Terry, see Todd, see Joe, see me. We'll get you to work, all right? We got leaks. We got all kinds of stuff. It's a fun, it's a grand old building, but it's an old building. But I will not tell you to do that and say, thus says the Lord. Like, I hope you will, but if you don't, we're not confined to this structure, we are the temple. Amen? So how do we apply this to us? Look at what he says. He's talking about the temple at that time. He's talking about us now. And he's saying to you, to me, to us, if we're Christians, consider your ways. So again, this, this message is just for you if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're off the hook. I want you to come to Christ. He is the only hope that you have but really, Haggai is talking to the people of God. And I would say from Haggai, from God, to you, to us, to them, consider your ways. He says that in verse 5. He says it again in verse 7. If God repeats himself, listen. Consider your ways. 
and then apply it to what the temple is now. The temple is us. The temple is the church. The temple is not Warsaw Baptist Church. The temple is any time two or three gather together in God's name. The temple is our church and GCC and Warsaw United Methodist Church. Our church is the global church, meeting all over in buildings and outside, all over the place. Our, our consideration needs to be, am I prioritizing that? Am I prioritizing the mission of the church, the people of the church, the people the church is trying to reach? Am I considering that over and above, prioritizing that over and above everything else, or like them who, who looked at their paneled houses when the actual physical temple was nothing, are you looking at all the cares and concerns of the world and not at all concerned, or it's on a much different shelf than your first priority, which is you and yours? Does that make sense? Let me, let me say it again. Is your priority the temple of God? Is your priority dwelling with God, letting God dwell with you, and then bringing other people into the presence of God through your evangelism, through your discipleship, through your love, through your giving, through your caring? Is that priority number one, or is something else a higher priority? Are you... Are you investing more in the kingdom? Financially, time, energy, thoughts, words. Are you, are, if, if somebody looked at your bank account, your calendar, and listened to you for a week, would they say number one priority is the kingdom of God? Number one priority is God's temple, the church. Number one priority is getting people to God. Or would they look at your bank account, your calendar, and listen to you for, for a week and say, no, this is more important. That's what Haggai would want us to consider. That's what God would say, consider your ways. It's not about this building. It's about God in the world. You are the temple of God. Is living water flowing from you into all the dry places? Is the light of the gospel shining into all the dark places from your life? Now, when I, when I preach something like this, I know most of us can say, I know somebody who's not doing it. I'm thinking about somebody else in a pew, or I'm thinking about somebody who's not here. Yeah, they need to prioritize God. But Haggai doesn't say consider so-and-so's ways. Consider your neighbor's ways. Consider your mama's ways. Consider your in-laws ways Haggai says consider whose your ways Haggai looks at me and says look in the mirror and say what's the number one priority so what so, so, so why does this matter I guarantee if you are struggling in a relationship right now it's because Jesus is not your number one priority I was, I was talking to a couple this week, and I, and, I, and I told them when I tell all couples, I guarantee if you are just running headlong to try to make this person your everything, you're both going to collapse under the weight of that. You can't, you can't be each other's functional saviors. But if you're running to Jesus and she's running to Jesus, you're going to meet right there in the middle. Things are going to work out. If you are both running to Jesus. That's why you need to keep your eye on the temple, which is the presence of God with you. If you're, if you're in a hostile workplace, you need to remember that that hostile workplace is not all there is. There is a spiritual reality that far exceeds the physical reality of your hostile workplace. And you are there in that dark workplace to be a little temple of God where the water of life flows out. You are in that hostile workplace maybe so that you can be the one person that can give another person hope. Because you're not the only one in the hostile workplace, right? You might be in a hostile workplace with a bunch of other people and they're all ready to give up and you say, no, let's give it all to God. 
What's the temple have to do with battling an addiction? Maybe you or someone you love is battling an addiction and you say, what in the world should I care about the temple of God for? This is all that's on my mind right now. If you're an addict, you know that all that's on your mind is getting the next fix. For me, it was getting the next drink. But Thomas Chalmers, an old dead guy, said, the reason the temple matters for this is because the only thing that will get rid of that hunger for that other thing, whether it's drugs or alcohol or porn or your job, if, if anything gives you your soul satisfaction other than God, the only thing that will push that away is an expulsive power of a new affection. In, in other words, when I, my affection is set on Christ and him dwelling with me and him dwelling with others and him just filling the whole earth, then I don't have room in my heart for that addiction anymore. That's what we need. We need the temple to push out the addiction. If you have financial stress, the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, he says, listen, and again, he's talking about a temple. We're talking about to the the kingdom moving out. He says, listen, if you bring your full tithe to me and put it into the house of God, put it into the temple, test me and see if I won't pour out every blessing on you and again this is not a health wealth thing i'm not saying bring your money to to us doesn't matter how much you give here i get paid the same thing until there's no money it doesn't matter how much you give here there's still going to be another thing to repair but if you will put your finances and say lord first fruits all of it is for your work in any way that that pans out My family, we give a tithe here, but then we don't give extra here because we give to the the church plant in Indianapolis. It's just what we do. We've said, here's the first part. If you say, here's the first part, see if he won't bless that. And again, I'm talking about the temple, his kingdom moving out, not this building. What does the temple have to do with grief? Some of you this week have lost loved ones. Putting your heart's focus on the reality that the temple is yet to come in this perfect dwelling with God is the only thing that's keeping some of you standing in your grief. I was talking to a brother today who lost his mom. And she's a saint. And she suffered for years. And so how does the temple help with grief? We know that in Christ, that person who is suffering is now free. That person who is suffering is now completely, joyously in the presence of God. What about our world that we're in right now? What about racial divisions that are all around us. Maybe not in this very, you know, white town. But anywhere else in the country, there is racial strife. And sometimes when you're in a community like this, you really don't even see it. And you're like, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. But what do we do? Why does the temple speak to that? Because in the temple, as the temple of God, in Ephesians, Paul says, we are the temple of God. And he also says, we are built up from all the different people. We are from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. We are the temple of God. So if we believe that, then we get to go out into this broken world and we get to, to, to go arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with other believers no matter what they look like, no matter what nation they're from, no matter what skin color they have, we are united. What about the, 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 the issue of authority? My, my cousin is a, is a cop. Do you know how hard it is to be a cop now? It's always been hard, but now they are immediately thought of as suspect because they're wearing that badge. How in the world does the temple help us with that? 
Well, the temple has a king, and the king is Jesus. And, and Paul says in Romans that the way you learn how to submit to the king is by submitting to the authority above you. Now, that doesn't mean that every authority or everybody with a badge is a good person, but they get the baseline of respect because we're called to, to honor the authorities above us. And I could preach for an hour how that also applies to the politicians above us. Some of us are way too comfortable bucking authority when we don't like who got voted in. The temple talks about all of it. The Bible is not just a dead book. The Bible is a, a, a sword that is living and active. And it will cut down to the heart and deal with anything that we're struggling with. Amen? This is what we need to see. This is what we need to know. So now we're going to share in a time that we call communion or the Lord's Supper. If you're new to church, uh, this is one of the two areas where God said, I want you to remember me and remember what I did to bring you into the temple, to bring you into the kingdom. I want you to remember in baptism, which we celebrate here occasionally, and, and through the Lord's Supper, which right now we, we, we share in on a monthly basis. I want you to remember every time you take this that I lived a perfect life and died the death that you deserved so that when the temple got opened up, you're in. You're invited. You're, you're welcome here. Amen? This is the beautiful gift that we have. If you're here and you're not yet a believer, this is one of the only two things in all of the church life that God says is just for believers. If you're here and you're not a believer, as we take the bread and we take the cup, I would plead with you, I would beg you to take Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen? And next month, come take the bread and the cup. But for all the rest of us, we're going to take this bread, we're going to take this cup, we're going to have you line up, just come up, pick up a cup of bread and a cup of juice, go back to your seats, and then we're going to pray and we're going to share this. And here's, let me just read this here real quick while they're doing that. Some of you are like, I'm done. No, you're not. Okay, so, so in Acts chapter 2, this is after Pentecost when the fire came down. These, these 3,000 souls were saved, and, and it says in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread in prayers. They devoted themselves to these things. Now, we're going to share the Lord's Supper, and I want you to be devoted to the God who gave us this picture. I do not want this to be a religious exercise. I want you to, as you take the bread, I want you to say, thank you, God, for, for what you've done for me, a sinner. Thank you, God, for what you've done for us. Thank you for giving me all of these messed up people to be my family, my temple here on earth. Thank you. Be devoted to the breaking of bread with the saints. Amen? In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this about the Lord's Supper. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, every time you do this, it is a picture that we are the temple until the true temple, Christ, comes. It's the new heavens and new earth. Make sense? It's all tied together. This is all one story. And you, Christian, are a part of this story. Remember that as we take the bread and the cup. All right, so 
Danny and Todd will be up here if you have any questions. There's a cup with bread. There's a cup with juice. If you're a believer, please come and get it. Take it back to your seat, and then we'll share it together.